good day. Yesterday in my video, I spoke about how the Russians appear to have been intensifying their attacks on all parts of the front line, how they seem to be pushing hard in the Kupiansk, Liman, Bakhmut, um, Avdevka, Marinka, Zaporozhye and Kherson parts of the front lines, how though, in my opinion, it all still falls well short of a full-scale general offensive. The Russians have increased the pressure and the tempo of operations very substantially since the brief lull that took place around, around the time of the Russian Orthodox Christmas on the 7th of January. Well, today we've had many more reports and they largely center on what is happening in Avdeevka. And if you believe these reports, which by the way, I should say I do, um, then it appears that the Russians have made significant progress in the south of Avdeevka and appear to be in the process of storming at least the southern part of the town. Now, there are lots of reports coming from all kinds of um, sources, not all of them consistent with each other. Riba, for example, gives one account. Others give a completely different account. It's not always diff possible to say exactly what is going on. But even Ukrainian sources now appear to be confirming that the situation on the southern uh, part, in the southern half of Avdevka, is becoming critical, that the Russians have indeed broken into the um, urban area of the town in multiple places, they're, that they're attacking from multiple directions at the same time. Um, I've discussed how over the previous couple of days, the Russian Air Force was very active, carrying out heavy bombing raids on Avdevka, and perhaps, just possibly, we're starting to see the results. It seems so. I'm going to make one further observation about these attacks on Avdevka, which is that, again, to my mind, they illustrate a point which I've made previously, that reporting this war from a distance, which, of course, we all have to do, all of us that cover this war, can be a pretty tough and, at times, thankless task. Uh, it's quite clear to me that if the Russians have indeed broken into places in the south of Avdevka to the extent that is being alleged, or even if they've broken into southern parts of Avdevka to a lesser degree than is being alleged, that must mean that they were much closer to Avdevka in the south, and by the way, also in the area of Tsar's Hunt, this restaurant area, and other places somewhat to the north of Avdevka. But anyway, we're talking about the southeastern end of Avdevka. They must have been much closer and got much closer um, to these areas than had been widely appreciated. And the reason for this, the reason this wasn't picked up, is not difficult to understand. In order for people, the various maspers, Suryak, the military summary channel, Riba, um, to adjust their maps, they need evidence of where the various uh, forces are located. And they rely on two sources, which is reports on the battlefronts, uh, which must ultimately come from the soldiers who are fighting there, and perhaps from commanders and people a little bit further up the command chain, and also from pictures, photographs, film, geolocations. And I have to say, on balance, they do a very good job. They approach their task in a very rigorous way. They don't all come to the same conclusions at the same time, and that is good. It shows that there is a diversity of views, and they all appear to have a great deal of respect 
for each other. And by the way, I should say that there are maps and reporters on the Ukrainian side, rather more maybe on the Russian side, some which strive to be equal. But I feel on balance that they still form a kind of community together. Anyway, they do a pretty good job, but they are dependent on the information they get. So if in a particular area there are no pictures, no film, no um, film and photographs which can be used to make geolocations, if there are no reports of actual fighting, then of course they won't adjust their maps and they won't show changes on the battlefronts. And that does not in and of itself mean that those changes are not taking place. It could be that there are significant advances and movements on the battlefronts taking place which are not being confirmed through reports and pictures because the commanders on each side have tightened up security, are making sure that such pictures, such film is not being circulated because providing that kind of information for whatever reason is not part of the respective military's agenda. Anyway, I make this point because I do want to stress a point I made several times. Absence of news does not mean that absence of, it, it does not necessarily translate to absence of events. Simply because something has been reported, simply because we may appear to be in a quiet period, doesn't mean that the period is actually quiet. It simply means that we're not getting as much information on a particular day as we would need to do in order to form a fully accurate picture. Anyway, let me say again, it does seem to me as if important events are taking place in Avdeevka. The Russians do seem to be making a concerted attempt to seize control of areas in the southeast of this town. Uh, there are some suggestions that they are intending to gain control over the next couple of days or weeks of around half the territory of Avdevka, which would be a pretty dramatic event if it happened. They've clearly broken into Avdevka in several places. Um, but going into more detail than that, I think at the moment is unwise. Now, all of this comes or came along with a report which I notice has been largely overlooked, though I am sure it's accurate, appeared in Slavyangrad, <coughs> which is a very, very accurate reporting site about the war. They would not, I think, have reported this if it had not actually been said. But anyway, there was a report citing comments by uh, Mr. Barabash, who is the Ukrainian civil administrator of Avdevka. I believe that he is not actually physically present in the town itself, but obviously he is intimately familiar with the situation there. And he all but he admitted that the communications, the transport links into Avdevka have now become extremely tenuous, extremely difficult for the Ukrainians to maintain, and he seemed to think that fairly soon, over the next few days or weeks, communication transport into Avdeevka would be entirely cut off, that the Russians would cut off Avdeevka entirely. And again, that actually does correspond with my own understanding of what is going on in Avdeevka itself. Again, there's been a huge amount of discussion about battles that have been happening in places like Pervomaisky, the village to the southwest of Avdeevka, which the Russians have incrementally and steadily been gaining control of, though they've been doing so now for some time. It's obviously not a simple battle. 
and the Russians also have been slowly and systematically uh, improving their positions to the west, northwest of Avdevka along the railway. They've been um, encroaching for some weeks now on the village of Stepovoye, launching occasional attacks towards Berdichi, moving armoured vehicles across the railway and advancing along the railway, north up the railway itself, uh, towards Ocheretenye. And again, I think people have been very focused on the details of these battles, perhaps losing sight of the fact that what makes these battles important is the fact that Ukraine is trying to keep communications, supplies, the supply lines to Avdevka itself open. And that is why it is seeking to defend these places. Uh, Berdichi, Stepovoye, Permomaisky, and all of the others. And the Russians don't necessarily need to capture any one of these villages in order to make communications, transport links, supplies to Avdevka increasingly difficult because it's clear that the Russians now have all the roads well within artillery range. And importantly, the Russian Air Force, as I've discussed, has been extremely active over the battlefields in Avdevka, which again, by the way, confirms that at least on this part of the battlefronts, the Ukrainian air defense system has essentially collapsed. We see aircraft like the Sukhoi 25 ground attack aircraft now actively striking at Ukrainian positions in and around Avdevka. And of course, if they're able to bomb Avdevka itself, they are able to bomb the roads leading to Avdevka. They're able to keep um, drones operating, monitoring what goes on on those roads. And clearly, until the Russians are able to capture all of those places that I spoke about, Stepovoye, Berdichi, Pervomaisky, um, they will not be able to seal the sack completely. They will not be able to encircle, fully encircle Avdevka entirely. But it still means, <laughs> whilst all this fighting is going on, and with the Russians, by the way, close to the roads in several places now, that sending reinforcements and supplies into Avdevka, though still possible, is becoming more and more difficult. Now, this is important because if it is indeed the case that the Russians have broken into Avdevka from multiple directions and are pushing the Ukrainians back in Avdevka, then that might also point to something else that I suspect it does, which is that the Ukrainians are now short of men in Avdevka itself. The military unit that has been defending Avdevka um, ever since the fighting here began in October is the 110th Brigade, um, a Ukrainian brigade, numbers around 4,000 men. By now, this brigade must have suffered very severe battlefield attrition. I'm not going to try and speculate how many troops are still serving in that brigade. But by this point, the number of troops the Ukrainians have from this brigade in Avdevka itself, who are battle ready, must have become much reduced. And of course, they can, as I said, send, still send reinforcements and supplies into Avdevka along these increasingly dangerous and precarious roads. But not all of the reinforcements will get through. Not all of the supplies will. Uh, it's no longer a case of being able to send long convoys of trucks and armored vehicles into Avdevka.
um, because, of course, that would be an obvious target for the Russian Air Force and the Russian artillery. So you can only send dribbles of men and machines and supplies at a time. And as I said, not all of those get through. And I suspect that gradually, steadily, the number of men and machines and supplies in Avdevka that the Ukrainians can call on is reducing. And it is this, more than anything else, which is making it possible for the Russians to achieve the gains that they are. Now, there's been suggestions made that Avdevka itself is about to fall, that the battle is now close or to a conclusion or coming close to a conclusion. I think most people who have been following this battle closely would probably be more cautious and would say that we've still got a fair way to go, um, even if the Russians are able to capture a significant part of Avdevka over the next few days and are able to consolidate their control, it will still take some time before the Russians are able to advance and clear the whole of Avdevka. And I suspect we've still got quite a lot of very intense and heavy fighting underway. But as I say many times, the direction of travel is clear. It's obvious to me that this battle is now uh, tilting ever more decisively in the Russians' favour. Avdevka will eventually fall. Even General Zaluzhny, the overall military commander of Ukraine's armed forces, has acknowledged as much. The only question is when and at what cost? At what cost to the Russians? obviously, but at what cost to the Ukrainians as well, given that the Ukrainians are short of men and short of supplies, and the Russians have an abundance of each of these things. Anyway, that's the news from Avdevka this morning. No doubt we'll be getting more updates over the course of the day and I'll be discussing them and will perhaps gradually get a clearer picture of what is going on. I'll be discussing all of these developments in my next programme. It's not only in Avdevka that the Russians have been hammering away. They've also been hammering away at Krinki and the Russian-appointed governor of Kherson region, uh, Vladimir Saldo, has now said more about the situation in Krinki. He's usually a fairly reliable commentator. He confirms that the Ukrainians have about 80 men left in Krinki. He speaks about a steadily deteriorating situation for the Ukrainians in Krinki. He says that, well, he strongly gives the impression that this battle in Krinki is now coming close to a conclusion. And uh, just to read the report, which, by the way, I'm getting this time from Slavyangrad, um, um, only from the right bank, um, the, uh, right, due to the powerful impact of our military and difficult weather conditions. This is all from Saldo. Um, as I said, I'm taking this from Slavyangrad, the telegram channel. The intensity of the Ukrainian armed forces' actions in the Krinki area has decreased significantly. Only from the right bank, 80 soldiers who survived are being supported using mortars and drones. Ammunition and fresh manpower are not being delivered. So he says there's 80 men left in Krinki, 80 Ukrainian troops left in Krinki. They're not really making any they really basically exhausted their ability to defend themselves. Um, what resistance the Russians are encountering uh, when they try to attack these remaining 80 troops that are still there, what resistance they encounter uh, 
is coming from mortars and drones um, directed by the Ukrainians from the West Bank, the Ukrainian-controlled West Bank of the Dnieper River. And um, there are no, there's no more ammunition and there's no more reinforcements being sent by Ukraine to trick the Krinky. And then, of course, um, <laughs> Saldo provided a list of the um, equipment that the Russians have been able to destroy in the area, presumably on the West Bank, two D-30 guns. These are old Soviet 122-millimeter guns, an, an, a mortar, an armed Humvee all-terrain vehicle. Um, um, and he also says that um, uh, um, FPV, Russian FPV drone operators dropped ammunition and destroyed four vehicles, two communications ab antennas and an observation post, and that air defense and electronic warfare forces uh, shot down, suppressed two uh, quadcopters, three FPV drones, and two heavy octocopters of the Baba Yaga type. type. And echoing something that the Russian Defense Ministry is also saying. Saldo says that the uh, Ukrainians now are losing roughly 30 men a day in this area, in the area of Krinky, but not just in Krinky, but also, of course, on the west bank of the Dnieper and in the islands that in the Dnieper, which lie between the west and the east banks, which the Ukrainians have tried, and to some extent have succeeded in occupying. So, um, a situation in Krinky, which is, well, it looks to me terminal. Um, and as I said, as far as I can see, since apparently it's all but impossible to evacuate these 80 men from Krinky, the only humane and rational thing to do would be to order them to surrender to the Russians and to bring this grisly battle to an end. But of course, as always, that is not what the Ukrainian command is prepared to do. And, well, that's Krinky. There's been a cascade of reports now about the Russians making further advances in the Rabotino Verbovoye area, they appear to be in the process of storming Rabotino itself. Apparently, there's some reports that Russian soldiers are now physically present again in that village, the village which the Ukrainians made so many attempts to capture over the course of uh, the summer offensive, which they eventually claimed they had captured, which was touted in the in Ukraine itself and in the Western media is some great victory that would lead to the acceleration of Ukraine's advance onto Tokmak, the small town that lies beyond the, uh, behind the first layers of the Surovikin line and which is on the way to the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. Never happened. But anyway, it seems that the Russians are in the process of gradually clearing Rabotino itself, and they do seem to be advancing in other areas of what is sometimes referred to as Bradley Square. Bradley Square because so many Bradleys were apparently destroyed there over the course of Ukraine's summer offensive. And I read somewhere, and I again have to admit, I forget where, certain comments by a Ukrainian soldier, which appeared to accept that the Ukrainians are gradually retreating um, in Bradley Square. They're gradually being pushed back. It's not huge battles that are taking place. The number of soldiers on each side is relatively small, but they're retreating step by step back to Orekhov, which around which fortified positions 
are being created. Orechov, of course, was the town, heavily bombed now by the Russian Air Force, but it was the town from which Ukraine launched its summer offensive, and it looks as if the Ukrainians are in effect being pushed all the way back to Orechov itself. So there we are. So that's Zaporozhye, and we've had less information over the last couple of hours from the Marinka area, from Novomikhailovka and um, Yurgevka. But as I said earlier in the program, the fact that we're getting less information isn't a sign that less is going on. It could be that an awful lot is going on, which is simply not being reported because the soldiers are under orders not to talk about it and the um, militaries on each side, for their own decisions, decided that they won't provide film, the kind of film that is used to produce... Um, to, to make possible geolocations, uh, the kind that the mappers, the various mappers of the f battle, try of the war, uh, um, regularly produce. We have had some reports, however, from the Bakhmut area, and these do appear to confirm some Russian progress in the northwest of the battle lines in Bakhmut, in, the, in and around Bogdanovka. Bogdanovka itself apparently continues to be uh, bitterly contested, but there's pictures of Russian soldiers raising a flag somewhere. I'm not sure where that is, by the way. There's some reports that the Ukrainians um, launched FPV drone strikes against these soldiers who raised the flag. I don't think that is confirmed, by the way, from the pictures I've seen, the film I've seen. But, of course, I'm not the best person to analyse and understand pictures. And there's also been multiple reports of intense fighting in the Liman and Kupiansk area. As Dima at the Military Summary Channel correctly pointed out, the Russians are now reporting very heavy losses amongst the Ukrainian troops defending in these areas, in the Liman area especially. Um, that may not be an accurate representation of Ukrainian losses. It may be that the Russians are getting the, their figures, their numbers wrong. I'm not vouching for the accuracy of the numbers the Russians are giving. But in the past, it has been possible to get a good sense of where the fighting has been most intense by lo looking at Russian estimates or reports of Ukrainian casualties. And it does seem now as if the fighting in the Liman and Kupiansk area is intensifying. So, pressure by the Russians every part of the front line. Now, before I proceed, <laughs> I'm going to just return to one particular topic, um, which brings me back to the subject about how we've got to be sometimes careful about the film and pictures we see. Um, film that each side provides may not necessarily be contemporaneous. It might actually show things that happened some time before. And if it is incomplete, it doesn't necessarily um, give us a fully accurate picture of exactly what happened. And I noticed that my old friend, I call him my old friend, we don't know each other, Colonel Hamish to Bretton Gordon, has now written another piece in the Daily Telegraph touting the... Um, ineffectiveness or supposed ineffectiveness of Russian tanks. I have to say, I find this, after all that's happened over the last few months, uh, um, a tiresome trope, actually, which still gets endlessly recycled. One wonders what exactly has to happen 
um, that will finally bury it. But anyway, never mind. Anyway, he he does that on the basis of this film that the Ukrainians provided of the battle between the T-90 tank, the Russian T-90 tank, and several um, Ukrainian in Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. And um, the T-90 tank, this particular T-90 tank, appeared to have lost the battle. And um, anyway, Hamish to Bretton Gordon, Hamish jumps on this and says, you know, this is proof that these tanks are really um, not very good. Even Bradley infantry fighting vehicles can destroy them. Well, we've now had actually a more complete versions of this film from various angles. And it does seem as if the battle was rather more complicated than the original film showed. It seems that the um, tank was involved in an encounter battle with several um, Bradleys. Uh, it does appear to have received some damage. It seems that, however, it was able to repel several attacks. Eventually, um, things happened to the vehicle, the tank, which caused its um, its crew to abandon the tank and to leave the tank. But the general view is that it appears to be still in an area that remains under Russian control and that it's not that severely damaged and that the Russians will be able to retrieve it and repair it. Is that correct? Again, I'm not able myself to study this film fully. But I suspect it is true. And again, I do want to say that film that each side provides obviously is skewed to show events from their perspective. Neither side should be blamed for doing that, by the way. And jumping to all kinds of grandiose conclusions on the basis of a single incident is, which may not be completely reported, seems to me very unwise. And writing a whole article in the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> setting up these sweeping and grandiose conclusions on the basis of that one incident seems to me to be unwise also. Some might call it clutching at straws. Anyway, there we go. Um, Whilst I'm on the subject I of strange articles in the Daily Telegraph, there's another one by David Axe, um, who regularly writes for Forbes, who claims that the Ukrainians are winning the jamming war, the electronic warfare war. I haven't seen a single other commentator, certainly none on the Russian or Ukrainian side, who agrees with him. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that. So... That's the situation on the battlefronts. Apparently, dramatic events happening in Avdeevka. Uh, I should say, more reports and from multiple sources that Ukrainian losses over the last couple of days have soared, which, given the intensity of the fighting, is unsurprising. Russian losses unquestionably must also have increased given how much more intense the fighting is. But to come back to the brutal calculus of war and this war in particular, the Russians can absorb these losses, the Ukrainians can't. The Russians can replace the men they've lost, the Ukrainians can't. The Russians can re rotate their troops which the Ukrainians cannot do. The Ukrainians have also said that Russian military formations that participate now in the special military operation are up to strength and Ukrainian military formations are not. So it is important that the Ukrainians are suffering heavy losses, important because it is tragic but it is also important in terms of the brutal calculus 
of war. And it is, of course, also important from that the Russians are suffering casualties also, and that is also tragic, but it has a different meaning in terms of the brutal calculus of war. Losses by Ukraine in terms of the eventual outcome of this battle currently matter more. And I think that is something that must be understood. So Russians pressing on every part of the battle lines and apparently dramatic events taking place in Avdevka and also equally dramatic events as we've discussed in other places in Krinky and more and more signs of general Ukrainian retreats. Now, there has been a most intriguing event, one which we can only piece together to some extent. Um, I have the benefit of a source who has provided me with reliable information in the past and who appears to be, or clearly is, in contact with some members of the Duma, the Russian parliament, or at least with some of their advisors, some of their people there. Um, anyway, a intriguing event about which we've not been provided by either side with full information. Now, a couple of days ago, the Russians launched a major missile and drone strike on Kharkov. And over the course of that missile and drone strike, they attacked and did massive damage to a hotel building. At the time I reported it, it seemed to me simply to be another event in the war, in the air war, where the Russians have been launching missile and drone strikes across Ukraine um, on an intensifying basis now. And then a couple of days later, the Russian Ministry of Defense claimed that 200 mercenaries, French mercenaries, as they described them, had been killed in the attack on this hotel. And that was already pretty remarkable, a very, very high death toll. And I speculated in a recent program that this seemed unusual, and I did wonder whether perhaps some of these um, French mercenaries might be more than they seemed from the Russian reports. Perhaps they were involved in some way in operating air defense systems for Ukraine. Anyway, it did seem that there was something unusual about this affair going beyond the very high casualties that the Russians were claiming that the French had suffered. Anyway, things then took a very interesting turn, which is that the Russians summoned the French ambassador to the foreign ministry, the Russian foreign ministry in Moscow. Now, that is a relatively unusual event when a foreign minister, when an ambassador is summoned to the foreign ministry that is almost invariably treat a sign of a severe rebuke being given by the host government to that ambassador. And it is a sign of significant tension between the two countries, in this case, Russia and France. And the ambassador duly went to the foreign ministry and stayed there, it seems, for several hours. Now, that also is unusual because what tends to happen, I mean, I'm not saying this is always the case, is that the ambassador comes to the foreign ministry, the official at the foreign ministry that the ambassador meets, then reads out a stern lecture. The ambassador then protests and um, strongly disputes whatever it is that the official says. The ambassador leaves the building, 
Sometimes the media is there waiting to hear what the ambassador is going to say. Sometimes the ambassador says something. And anyway, the whole incident is usually over within a relatively short time. So the fact that the ambassador was there for longer on this occasion, or so it seems, suggests to me that this was more than just a simple rebuke, that the Russians were providing the ambassador with information, a lecture, if you like, but a lecture backed by evidence. Anyway, the ambassador left. He refused this time to say anything to the working, to the journalists. And then we started to get defiant statements coming out of Paris. The first statement was that France cannot prevent French citizens from going to fight in Ukraine if that is their choice. By the way, that is emphatically not true. Uh, governments commonly act to prevent their citizens becoming involved in particular um, wars. It's by no means unusual. And um, if French citizens went and fought on the Russian side, as by the way some of them have done, um, I'm pretty sure that the French authorities would not look kindly upon it. And any French citizens caught doing that who found their way back to France, well, they might face legal problems. I'm not going to discuss or elaborate on that further. Anyway, so a defiant statement, you know, we're not going to prevent French citizens going to fight in Ukraine if that is their choice, which is, or so it seems to me, the French coming back and telling the Russians that they're going to do, go on doing exactly what they have been doing before, whatever it was that the Russians were complaining about, and they're just going to go on doing it. And then there was further comments from no less a person than President Macron of France himself. And Macron said that um, the war in Ukraine is so important that um, the Western powers cannot afford to allow Russia to win. Now, that's an interesting formula, by the way, and it's, by the way, starting to be repeated by more and more Western officials without actually quite saying as much. They're no longer talking about Ukraine winning the war. They're talking about finding some means to stop Russia winning the war. Anyway, I'm not going to go into all of this. But it's not difficult to work out that this all is connected to what happened in Kharkiv. And it's clear to me that an awful lot of people were killed in that, that hotel and that the Russians almost certainly are correct that a large number of them were French. And it could be that the Russian claims that up to 200 French personnel, people, were killed in this strike. Well, they're starting to look as if they're probably true. So what happened? Well, I come back to the information that was provided to me by the source. And I'm going to be here again extremely careful about what I say. I'm not going to provide all the information that this source has provided, except I will say that I'm very grateful to him for providing me with all of this information. Um, and, well, suffice to say that it does look like those people who were in that hotel were there at the behest of the French government. According to this source, the view in Russia is that they were actually serving personnel of the French um, armed forces and security services, intelligence personnel, um, probably controllers and coordinators and that kind of thing. They might have been involved to some extent in Ukraine's air defense operations. 
but they might also have been involved in other activities, which I'm not going to discuss. As I said, I don't, I'm conscious that the, um, I'm conscious about the need to not say too much about the person who's providing me with this information. Anyway, piecing it all together, it seems that the Russians concluded that the French had crossed a red line, that their people, their armed forces in effect, were directly participating in the fighting, that this fiction that these people are simply mercenaries, volunteers who've gone to fight there, in this case, was wearing altogether too thin, and the Russians decided that on this occasion they would go back on an unwritten agreement that exists between the Western powers and the Russians, which is that they don't target each other's personnel when they're doing covert operations in various proxy wars. On this occasion, the Russians did. Apparently, the decision to do that came from very high levels. Again, I'm not going to say which levels. And this devastating attack was carried out. And it looks as if it has done very significant damage to France, to the French military. And the French have been upset and angered by, by it. They made these defiant statements, the statements, as I said, by Macron. And they've unrolled announcements that they're going to build 75 more Caesar self-propelled guns for Ukraine. More, by the way, than the French army itself has. Um, I don't think anybody takes that terribly seriously, by the way. And the Ukrainians have been complaining for some time that the Caesar howitzers are simply not fit for purpose on their battle lines. But anyway, I'm not going to go there. But it does look as if this has been a major blow and shock for France, that the Russians are very angry about what the French did, that the, French, the Russians took a decision to strike at these French, uh, this French um, grouping, and that the, um, <clears throat> at the same time, as that happened, um, they gave very, very strong warnings to the French not to do this again. Now, there's another little piece of intrigue coming out of this because um, though this source confirms that the largest grouping group of Westerners in this hotel were indeed French, um, the source also says that there were other Westerners there as well. And over the last 24 hours, there are rumours circulating that a senior Italian office, military officer, I believe he has um, the rank of a lieutenant colonel, um, he's been identified by name, but I'm not going to repeat the name on this programme, that he has been killed in Ukraine as well. And I wonder whether he was also in this hotel. And bearing in mind that the air defence system that France delivered to Ukraine, the Aster system, is apparently a joint project by France and Italy. And it's also, by the way, operated by Britain. It's the primary air defence system. Uh, uh, a shipborne version is a primary air defence system of certain British warships, including some of the warships currently in the Red Sea. But anyway, given that the Aster system is a French-Italian project, I wonder whether this Italian officer was also somehow involved in it and that this had something, again... This played some role in what happened, uh, how he died. Maybe he was working with these some of these French officers who may have been involved in air defence activities. 
as part of the art stair system in this hotel in Kharkiv. Anyway, that's my guess. I don't know. Um, I've not had any sources about this at all. What I will say is this. The West has become increasingly reckless about the way in which it engages in this conflict in Ukraine. I don't think that this is, well, this certainly hasn't um, passed notice in Russia. They're certainly aware of it. Um, the Russians do have red lines. They do enforce them. It is essential that the French, the Americans, the British, all of these understand that there is a line between war and peace. And if one crosses that line, then one can find oneself in a war, whether one wants to be there or not. Going back to what Macron said directly after the visit of his, rather the summons of his ambassador to the Russian foreign ministry, I noticed that Macron actually said that France is not at war with Russia, but France and the West cannot allow Ukraine to win, right, Russia to win in Ukraine. He seemed to be going out of his way, in other words, to say that France is not at war with Russia. I wonder whether what happened during the ambassador's summons to the foreign ministry in Moscow is that the Russians said very clearly to the ambassador, after providing him with detailed information about what the French were doing in this hotel and elsewhere in Ukraine, whether the Russians didn't give a warning that they construed some of these activities as consistent with acts of war. Anyway, an interesting event, in some ways a rather concerning one, but one nonetheless which um, we don't have the full information about. The Russians are still calling these people mercenaries, though I suspect that they don't really believe that that is what they were, but they're still exercising some self-restraint here. They're saying these people were mercenaries. They don't want to publicly say that the French have engaged in an act of war against them. And the French, as I said, acting defiantly, though one does wonder whether there isn't going to be a lot of agonizing and heart searching in Paris with people angry and upset and worried about what has happened. Now, there have been other things. There is a huge NATO exercise being going to happen in um, Eastern Europe. 90,000 men are going to be involved. Once upon a time, that would have been considered an enormous exercise. But bear in mind that the Russians now have 460,000 men, apparently, fighting in U Ukraine itself, or at least um, the boundaries of pre-1991 Ukraine. They have another half a million men still with, inside Russia itself, but busy re-equipping and training and rearming. When set against those sort of numbers, 90,000 suddenly begins to look a little less impressive. And we also know that many of the militaries, in Europe at least, are now in very bad shape. The Slovak government has said that the amount of military equipment that the previous government of Slovakia, the one that lost the election a few weeks ago, uh, um, the election that Robert Fico won, they're complaining that the previous government shipped so, ma so many of um, Slovakia's weapons to Ukraine that Slovakia has barely any left 
They've got no air, air force to speak of, no air defence system. They're out of artillery, they're out of shells. Slovakia has been, in effect, disarmed by NATO itself as part of this crusade that NATO is waging against Russia in Ukraine. And that may be an extreme case, but we're getting... Lots of reports that the German military is in very poor shape. We're getting reports that the British military is in very poor shape. And I'm sure that is true of most NATO militaries already also. But put that aside, there is this 90,000 man exercise taking place. And all kinds of people are drawing all kinds of conclusions about this. They're saying that this is an attempt by the NATO to create... Um, barrier force to stop a Russian advance to Berlin or a Russian attack on the Baltic states or that it's intended to create some great big base camp in um, Eastern Europe which can then be used to feed weapons and supplies and personnel to Ukrainian forces still struggling to battle on in Western Ukraine, if and when the Russians ever get there. And there are other um, theories as well. Some people are even suggesting that if there's a Ukrainian collapse, these NATO forces could advance into Western Ukraine itself. Now, if they do that, I think the prospects, the possibilities of a clash, an armed clash with the Russians, become extremely high indeed. Some Russian officials have hinted that any Western military formations that any enter any part of Ukraine are, as far as the Russians are concerned, legitimate targets for military action. That would be an incredibly dangerous escalation, though I have to say that there have been some comments by some US officials including recently President Biden himself, which might suggest that there are some people reckless enough, or in my opinion, to say it correctly, insane enough to think of such a thing. But my own view, for what it is worth, is that this big exercise is primarily being done in order to reassure the East Europeans and the Baltic states. NATO has suffered a major defeat in terms of its prestige as a result of the defeat of Ukraine's summer offensive. There is growing alarm that Ukraine is now facing defeat and that this exposes NATO's weakness so it becomes especially important in this kind of situation to reassure the East Europeans that actually NATO is strong after all and that if the Russians do advance west, NATO is still in a position to protect them. So far from being a show of strength, I think this exercise is perhaps better understood as a confession of weakness. Anyway, that's my own view. Some people will no doubt argue otherwise. I don't personally think, however, that any of the dramatic um, things that people expect to come out of this exercise are in fact going to happen. Now, on the question, however, of the future of the war, we have had some very interesting developments from the United States. And there's been an extraordinary article that has appeared in NBC News. And this is connected with these intense arguments and discussions that have been taking place between the Biden administration and Congress about getting Congress to authorize further funding for Ukraine. And the article in NBC News says, incredibly stark, 
Biden aides give lawmakers a grim assessment of Ukraine without more aid. And um, we're told that President Joe Biden's top aides, that means, of course, Sullivan, <laughs> Jake Sullivan and people like him, uh, bluntly told lawmakers in a private meeting on Wednesday that if Congress fails to authorize additional military aid for Ukraine in the coming days, Russia could win the war in a matter of weeks, months at best, according to two people familiar with the meeting. And then NBC basically tells us who these two people were. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and the Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines told the lawmakers that Ukraine will run out of certain air defense and artillery capabilities in the coming weeks, according to the people familiar with the meeting. So, Jake Sullivan and Avril Haines, who is the Director of National Intelligence, met with these Congress people, told them Ukraine is facing catastrophe, unless you cough up more money. And then immediately, as soon as that was over, two people whom, shall I say, I would not be surprised if they were Jake Sullivan and Avril Haines, dashed off and briefed NBC about what was said. And then it goes on to say the grim assessment, which one White House official, perhaps Sullivan, described as incredibly stark, was delivered as the future of Ukraine aid has never been more uncertain. It also comes as White House officials are increasingly alarmed at the prospect of Biden failing to follow through with his promise that the US will be there for Kiev as long as it takes. And then that uh, we goes on to say, um, in Wednesday's meeting at the White House, Sullivan and A. Haynes told gave the top congressional leaders a classified time frame for when Ukraine's key military resources will be significantly depleted and a detailed assessment of the current dynamics on the battlefield. The two people familiar with the meeting said, a detailed assessment of the current dynamics on the battlefield. So they're telling us that Ukraine is losing the battle that all of the reports we're getting from Slavyangrad, military summary channel, Riba. I would particularly highlight Slavyangrad because, as I said, I think that they are perhaps the most critical um, of these. And, of course, they also get their reports from a variety of sources. Um, though Dima at the Military Summary Journal, does, I think, a good job too. But anyway, what they've been telling us is true. <laughs> I mean, th this is what the NBC report says, that these Russian advances in Avdevka, in Krinky, in Kupiansk, in Bakhmut, that they're actually really happening. That is what the Americans have come to understand, that the situation for Ukraine is indeed becoming desperate on the battlefields. The Russians are pushing and the Ukrainians are cracking. Just say, <laughs> if you read articles in the media which tells you otherwise, that give you rosy pictures of how well the Ukrainians are doing, you know, tanks, uh, uh, Russian tanks being blasted out of the sky by um, Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, uh, Ukraine winning jamming wars, all of that kind of thing. Well, the Americans know that it is not like that at all. The detailed assessment of the current dynamics on the battlefield point to a Ukrainian defeat within weeks or months. At least that is what Sullivan and Haynes told Congress. And the article then goes on to say Sullivan emphasized that Ukraine's position would grow more difficult over the course of the year by off 
uh, a White House official said, by offering specific date ranges of when Ukraine will run low on various capabilities in the short term. The um, president's aides told the lawmakers that the lack of aid would affect far more than Ukraine and could prom prompt other countries that rely on the US, including Japan and South Korea, to rethink their alliances. Their message, these people said, was that a Russian victory, simply because the US couldn't come through, will reverberate around the world. Now, those of us who remember the Vietnam War and who've also familiar with the history of the Vietnam War, which has been published extensively in many, many books and publications and articles, will find all of this dreadfully familiar. There is going to be a collapse in American credibility if the United States loses in Vietnam. There's going to be a collapse in American credibility if America loses in Ukraine. It loses in Ukraine, note, not because of anything the Russians have done, but because the US couldn't come through. Um, in all cases, whenever in, in Vietnam um, this, there was um, a deterioration of the situation on the ground, there would be briefings to Congress, to the media as well, that the situation was catastrophic. And in order to avoid this catastrophic loss of prestige and face, the United States needed to escalate further. They needed to do more. And of course, in the case of Vietnam, that led to a half a million US troops being sent into the battle with the consequences all of us know. It is exactly the same script. It is being played out all over again. It's astonishing how the more things change, the more they remain the same. But there it is. That's what Sullivan and Haynes told Congress. Will it succeed? Well, probably. <laughs> um, the political dynamics in the United States are becoming more difficult. American public opinion is becoming more hostile. And Donald Trump, who is now increasingly succeeding in his bid to become the Republican Party's nominee in the presidential election, their candidate in the presidential election, he won a convincing victory in the Iowa caucuses. And it's now starting to be suspected that he will probably win in New Hampshire and, New and South Carolina as well. If he wins in these two places, I would say it was all but over, actually. But that's my assessment. Anyway, he has made it absolutely clear that he is hostile to continued support for the war. And Republicans in Congress up to now have been saying that, you know, they're not really prepared to go on funding Ukraine. Speaker Johnson has talked about two conditions that must be fulfilled before Congress will provide funding for Ukraine. One is that the administration must take steps to bring the situation in on the United States' border under control. And there's always ambivalence, ambiguity about what that means. Uh, one gets the sense that the administration always says that they're prepared to make concessions. Though it's never quite clear what those concessions are. The Republicans, Speaker Johnson always says this isn't quite enough, but he's never made it absolutely clear what he wants. Anyway, there is ambiguity about that. But perhaps more rationally, <laughs> though perhaps not in the end conclusively, Speaker Johnson also has repeatedly said that there isn't any real sense in providing more funding for Ukraine unless the administration, 
can provide a clear idea of what it intends to do, what its plan for victory or to end the war in Ukraine actually is. And by the way, if you go back to this article in NBC, it's quite clear that Sullivan and Haynes came up with no such plan. They said, look, if you don't authorize more funding, there's a real possibility Ukraine will collapse at some point in the next few weeks or months. They're quickly running out of artillery shells. They're quickly running out of air defense missiles. The Russians are getting more of each. Sooner or later, there will be a collapse and the situation on the battlefronts is becoming dire. It is becoming catastrophic. The Russians are advancing on every front. They're pushing forward and Ukraine's ability to hold them off is diminishing by the day. All true. But the one thing Sullivan and Haynes don't seem to have been able to do is come forward and tell Mike Johnson and Congress, well, give us all of these weapons, give us all this money so that we can get more weapons. And if you give us this money, this is what we will do. We will execute this plan, execute that plan, and eventually we will either win the war conclusively against the Russians or put them in a position where they have to capitulate and accept our terms. They don't seem to have been able to do, to do that because, of course, they can't. They can't present a plan which intelligent people couldn't instantly pick holes in. Now, what is going to happen? It seems, again, that an effort is being made to increase the pressure on the House of Representatives, or I should say on Republicans in the House of Representatives, by trying to get the Senate to come forward and vote appropriations for Ukraine. In the Senate, there is clearly a majority for funding for Ukraine, though it does seem as if there is also a groundswell of opposition by Republicans in the Senate against it. In the House, well, who knows? I am not going to make any predictions here. I do not have the granular understanding of American politics to predict what Congress, Speaker Johnson, people like him are going to do. I do suspect that the steady advance of Donald Trump is having an effect on their thinking. Um, they're probably saying to themselves, if Donald Trump does become the party's candidate, for the uh, November election, um, given the stance on Ukraine that he has publicly taken, it would be anomalous and embarrassing and politically dangerous for Republicans in Congress to do the diametric opposite to what Donald Trump is saying by <laughs> authorizing funding for Ukraine, especially given the feeling in the United States. Against that, I suspect that many Republicans in Congress have visceral feelings about Russia, just as Democrats do. Many of them are strongly supportive of the military industrial complex. Many of them have visceral feelings about President Putin himself. Many of them also probably worry that if there is a collapse in Ukraine this year, they don't want to be put in a position where the Republican Party is blamed for it. So, as I said, I am not going to try to guess what is going to happen. If, if you push me hard, I s probably lean to the view that Congress will authorise funding eventually, though perhaps not the full $61 billion. But, you know, that's... Not, that's just a guess from an uninformed man. You certainly shouldn't put 
any weight on it. But put that aside, come back and attend to what Jake Sullivan and Avril Haines have told Congress. Situation in Ukraine is becoming catastrophic. Ukraine is running out of weapons. It is the dynamics on the battlefield are against it. Ukraine has failed so far to sign off on its mobilization law. The United States remains, as we know, extremely short of ammunition. Its ability to increase ammunition, artillery ammunition, is um, limited. And the Russians are not only producing far more ammunition, but they're also producing many more drones and more powerful drones. All of the facts point clearly in one direction. Given that this is so, and given that on any objective assessment, there is nothing that the administration can do that could change the underlying dynamic of the war in Ukraine, the logic of the briefings, of the briefing that um, Sullivan and Haynes have given to Congress points, I would have said unmistakably, to the need to start peace talks. Well, I'm not the only person to think this. I discussed yesterday in my programme a article by Newsweek, in Newsweek, by two former U.S. diplomats, one head of, uh, head of mission in Saudi Arabia, another a uh, um, specialist on Soviet and post-Soviet stud Russia, um, and they said exactly the same, the same thing. Even Zelensky, to a certain extent, is now saying this. He's come forward and said, as I discussed in my program yesterday, that there aren't enough shells being produced in the world, he of course means the Western world, to satisfy Ukraine's needs. There just aren't enough. So, why prolong this war by just a few months? Why allow more Ukrainians to die? Why cause further dem devastation to this country? You really care about loss of reputation by the United States if the Russians win a victory in Ukraine, then the way you deal with that is not by reinforcing failure in a losing war. It is by trying to negotiate and find some kind of outcome which enables you to walk away with as much of your prestige as you can. Well, there is a very simple answer to this, um, as I've discussed many times. Neocons have no reverse gear. That's been proved time and again. And the real point of this exercise is not ultimately to win the war in Ukraine or to preserve the prestige of the United States. It is to avoid another collapse, another collapse of an American ally massively over-reinforced in an election year. Well, there we are. That's all I'm going to say today about the situation in Ukraine. In fact, for the moment, this is where I'm going to end the video. There's more news coming from the Middle East. Um, missile and bombing strikes on the Houthis in Yemen are now becoming routine. They're taking place there now every day, so far as I can see. It is not preventing the Houthis from launching more strikes on, America, on commercial shipping in the Red Sea. As I discussed yesterday, even Biden himself, the President of the United States, admitted that all of these bombing and missile strikes on the Houthis will not achieve that objective, but apparently... They must continue, the United States must continue with these bombing and missile strikes anyway. Uh, uh.
the logic of which I confess once more totally escapes me. We've also had more reports of a Israeli attack on an Iranian target which is said to have killed a senior officer of Iran's um, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. It seems that we're moving steadily towards a major escalation in the Middle East. And I can't help but think that rumours, which I suspect are a lot more than just rumours, that Saudi Arabia is preparing a peace plan. Um, I discussed that in my program yesterday. And fears, which I gather are beginning to gather strength, that the ICJ is preparing to make some sort of decision which will be critical of Israel. I suspect all of that is actually, if anything, driving faster the momentum towards war. But we are still in that limbo situation where things have not yet fully come together. And until they do, I think it's perhaps best for me to hold peace. So as I said, this is where I end this video today. It is interesting to know that the United States government is actually well informed about the true situation in Ukraine. When they read all these absurd articles in the media about how the Ukrainians are going from strength to strength, winning battle after battle, you know that they know that that isn't really true. They never go out of their way to correct them. They never contradict these Ukrainian narratives. But of course, when it comes to the need to get money out of Congress, then suddenly, in private briefings, they tell Congress how bad the situation really is. You want to understand why Americans have come to distrust their government, why there is now a credibility gap, another term, by the way, from the Vietnam War era, a credibility gap emerging. Well, it's not difficult to work out why. But as I said, this is where I end my program today. Just to remind you once more, you can find all our programs on our various uh, platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you will find all sorts of amazing things. Magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you like this video, to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.